Good evening. Uh, I want to post another Sunday School lesson. Uh, this is on uh, Jesus the Healer. Um, several references. Um, chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, Chapter 7, and Chapter 10. So I uh, probably won't go through all of those uh, in depth, I'm certain. But uh, I do really want to touch on some some uh, interesting topics out of each one. And um, chapter 7, we'll probably be looking at it the least. But uh, before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time to look into your word. We pray for any that might hear this that don't know you as their Savior. We pray for your spirit to draw them. Your mercy be upon them. Lord, please help. Me to rightly divide your word as we look at this. Help each and every one of us to learn something, Lord, to, to be the witness you need us to be. And again, Lord, we lift you up as our friend and Savior, our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords. These things we ask in Jesus' name, and on your will be done. Amen. Uh, we'll look at uh, chapter Mark, and uh, some of these are recorded in the other Gospels, too. And we want to bring in a few things out of the other Gospels. Uh, at times, but we'll look at Mark chapter 1 and uh, we'll read verse 40 first. Uh, and there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Uh, a key to this verse here, I think, is when the leper says, If thou wilt. Uh, this is also found in, in Matthew chapter 8. Now I'm going to read uh, verses 1 and 2 out of Matthew chapter 8 to kind of get a picture of what's going on in Jesus' life at this time. And, of course, Jesus became a popular fellow. And, you know, anyone who could go around and uh, healing a bunch of people like he did, that would make you very popular. Because, you know, all of us has got some kind of uh, something that's wrong. You know, many, many of us here are, uh, maybe don't have nothing real serious. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wearing glasses. I've worn them since the third grade. Uh, Adam and Eve, I don't think they needed glasses. They didn't have any uh, any uh, deformities of any sort, any type of illness of any sort. Uh, before the fall, I don't think they had any problems physically. Uh, they were they were perfect. But um, when the curse came upon us and uh, the sin curse and... Uh, Mankind is a lot different now. We've had thousands of years of uh, genetic defects that came upon us because because of sin. And uh, you know, Adam and Eve they got the the ball rolling because of one man's sin. Uh, sin entered into the world, but by Jesus Christ, one man uh, he paid for all those all those sins. Uh, that's the important thing. Uh, Adam and Eve, uh, I, I feel like they had a, a special relationship where. Uh, you know, God wasn't holding them accountable. And that's the way I look at it. Um, God was not holding them accountable. But we are accountable now uh, because they, when they did that not tree of knowledge of good and evil, they had the knowledge of good and evil. So they were accountable for their actions. A small baby is, isn't accountable for their actions. or they don't. There are a lot of things they do they don't know better. But to come to a point where we know better, and uh, I've, I've always said, many, many times I've said, you know, People will do something really bad, and I say, well, they didn't know better. I'm sure they did. They had to do it, you know, and that's the way most of us do. But here it gives a little bit of information, uh, Matthew chapter 8, about what was going on in Christ's life. It says, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. But now over in Luke... Uh, I want to read Luke chapter 5, I believe it is. Yeah. <clears throat> you see the multitudes are following Christ now. So, and, But this leper was able to get to him. And in Luke we have a little more detail uh, about just what happened. In the uh, 12th verse it says, And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell at his face, fell, I'm sorry, fell on his face, and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now after Christ healed this man, he told him, you know, don't, uh, don't go tell anybody about this. Um, but, let's see, uh, let me 
here. Um, and he charged him to tell no man. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. But uh, <clears throat> he went and told anyway. It would have been hard not to have told that, wouldn't it? If you had leprosy. Uh, a, a few things about leprosy to understand what's going on. Uh, now here we see, uh, before I move on to that, but I want, I want to take note here. Christ was in the city here, it tells us, when this happened. So he came down off that mountain. There were multitudes around him. But when he was in that city, um, you know, Christ told the leper, you know, don't tell anybody. So maybe they had gotten off by themselves or nearly by themselves somehow. I don't know just how that was. But if there was a multitude around him, they would have seen this happen. And it was a tremendous miracle. But maybe in the, when he got into the city, there was a time when Christ was um, more over by himself. Maybe I'm not sure just how this unfolded. You know, he see little snapshots, as I say, of, of Christ's life. and We don't know all the fine details. But somehow or another, this leper got to Christ, even though there were multitudes around him. And uh, lepers, it's uh, interesting that he was in the city, but there were different types of leprosy. Uh, there was a leprosy that, uh, in, in modern days, they determined that uh, leprosy that was very crippling that really devoured a person and uh, there were some forms that wasn't as bad uh, but there were certain ways to take care of the leprosy and one way was quarantine but this leper uh, found him his way into the city it sounds like uh, in second kings chapter 7 um, it tells the story that happened in elisha's time the, the syrians they came down and seized they siege to Jer to not Jerusalem, Samaria, the northern in the northern kingdom. So um, there were some lepers though outside that city, and uh, naturally they were put out of the city because they had a quarantine. Uh, I want to read uh, Numbers. Let's see which Bible I marked that in. I got it marked in this one. I know. Numbers chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper and every one that hath an issue, and whatsoever and whosoever is defiled by the dead. Both male and female shall ye put out. Without the camp shall ye put them, that they defile not their, their camps in the midst whereof I dwell. So they had to put them in quarantine. You know, we know a little bit about quarantine uh, from the COVID thing, where we had to isolate ourselves from people, even though you know, we didn't want to, but we didn't want to give them something if, if we had it, and uh, we wanted to stop the spread of it. We didn't want to get anything either. Uh, I had it twice, and the first time was, was pretty rough. I, I think, I feel like I've been sicker when I had the flu, maybe. But uh, it wasn't fun. <laughs> it wasn't good. Uh, some people had it really rough. Some people passed away from it. And uh, that's the sad, the sad thing about it. But um, we had to keep ourselves away from people to keep from the spread of it. And, you know, I couldn't go to work when I, I, had, when I didn't feel like working <laughs> anyway. I couldn't go to work. But uh, I had to stay away until I was, they were sure that I was, was clear. So we don't want to give something to somebody. And that was part of the reason here, but they're also ceremonially unclean. Uh, this isolated them from God, from worshiping with the other people, in other words. And I'm not saying God uh, forsook them, but I'm just saying that they couldn't go in and worship with the other people. They were ceremonially unclean. Um, there was a, these four lepers uh, outside Jerusalem, when the, the Syrians came up against them, of course, they're out there, and God sent fear among the Syrians. They thought the Hittites and the Egyptians had been hired against them by the Israelites. God made them hear the sound of like a, an army, like a host coming upon them. And for fear, they just left their their animals. You know, you thought they would have rode the horse away, but that's probably what I would have done. But they left some animals there. They left in the way they they just threw away their garments that they so they could i guess move faster uh they ran away and god had put that fear upon them 
because it caused them to hear this noise like an armies were coming against them. And these lepers went out and they found food, they found uh, their treasures that they had, their uh, things of value, and they started hiding these things. And you know, if you were in that situation, you know, you're a leper and you can't work, you're out there at the mercy of someone to, to feed you and care for you, um, find whatever food you can find, I guess, out in the wild, but uh, they, they hid these things. and. I guess so they could sustain themselves and then they started feeling guilty and they thought we need to go back and tell them in the city because people in the city are starving so they did and uh, that's that's how that played out uh, the, but these lepers were outside the city uh, in uh, 2 Kings 15 verses 1 through 7 it tells the story of Azariah if I pronounce that right he's king of Judah He's the king of Judah, and he was a good king. But he got the bright idea that he was going to burn incense in the house of the Lord, and uh, they tried to tell him, no, don't, don't do that. That's not your your place to do that. So he did it anyway, and he was struck down with leprosy and had to separate himself in another house. And he had leprosy until he died. Um, if you um, look in Second Chronicles chapter 26, he that tells uh, about him there, but his name is Uzziah, if I pronounce it, U-Z-Z-I-A-H. Uh, same guy, but just a different name. But he had to isolate himself. So leprosy uh, isolated people back then. Sin isolates you from God, doesn't it? Uh, there was no remedy given in the Bible for the leprosy. Uh, if you remember Moses, um, God showed him that he could heal leprosy. He healed Miriam and Moses. Um, I can't remember exactly how the story goes, but I think Moses put his hand in, so I think in his bosom, how it says. But you know that you'd have to look that up to get the details. But and he it became leprous, and he, but God healed him of it. And God showed him that he, you know, he had the power to to take care of the job that Moses was assigned to. Um, but no treatment is mentioned in the Bible for leprosy. Um, <clears throat> they do uh, give instructions on how to diagnose leprosy and how to handle it. And if you go to um, Chron uh, Le Leviticus um, chapters 13 and 14, there's quite a bit. I won't turn to them because there's a lot of writing there, and it take a lot to decipher all that. But it tells how they're to handle leprosy. Someone with leprosy, how they were to diagnose it, and the person. And this is important here. The person who is to do that is the priest. That was assigned to the priest. Um, I want to turn to Second uh, Kings. Uh, I have it marked in this Bible. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. I'll read, uh, I'll read uh, verse 5 also. Now this is talking about Naaman, uh, captain of the host. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. That's verse 1 out of chapter 5. Now jump down to verse 5. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten chains of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he ran his clothes and said, Now listen to this, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man does send me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. Now the the servant girl that 
the Syrians had taken out of Israel, um, told Naaman about how he could go down to the man of God and be healed. Um, <clears throat> In verse 3 it says, And she said unto her mistress, Would God that my Lord were were with the prophet that is in the, in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. So it's I wanted to bring this out. It's amazing. This girl here is a captive. She's become a servant now to the Syrians, the enemy. But yet she is willing to witness to them. And I thought, that, are we willing to witness to our enemies? Are we willing to tell them about Christ? Uh, I think this little girl is a, is a great testimony to the attitude that we should have, even as a captive here in Syria, she is witnessing to the ones that she's serving. Uh, <clears throat> so this king of Israel, he sends this letter, and I'm sorry, the king of Syria sends this letter. The king of Israel says, hey, you know, am I God to kill and to make alive that a man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? So from that, we figure that it just, there was no cure back then. They, it took a miraculous event. It had to be supernatural to cure a person from leprosy. Um, <clears throat> now, like I say, there's probably different degrees of leprosy. And uh, I think there, in, like I say, look in Leviticus 13 and 14. And if a person got better, uh, the priest is determined if they could come come back into the, the congregation or not. So that's important. Leprosy separated them from, from worshiping with the congregation. It separated them from their loved ones. And, you know, sin does the same thing. Leprosy, leprosy can be used to represent sin because sin does just that. It separates you from God. It separates you from your loved ones. <clears throat> uh, sin always has a bad outcome. Um, now, Naaman was, when he finally got in touch with Elisha, Elisha tells him, you know, go down to the Jordan and dip seven times. Now, uh, if someone told me, you know, go over to the high river, jump in there seven times, and you can throw these glasses away. No longer your eyes will be healed. You never never have to wear glasses again. Uh, would that make sense? Did it make sense to Naaman to jump into the dip into the Jordan River seven times? At first he didn't he didn't want to do it. Excuse me. But then he he realized after he was told, you know, if you were told to do something hard, you would have done that. But this is something easy. So so he was obedient and he was healed. Um, the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't sound like it makes sense to the world. They don't think it can be that easy. Trust, putting your faith and trust in the blood of Jesus Christ is all it takes for salvation. Believing that he paid your sin debt. It's just that simple. Naaman was just told, hey, just, just wash in the Jordan River seven times. Dip in there seven times and you'll be healed. And he was. And it's just that simple salvation is being washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's that simple to the world. That doesn't make sense. But it's a supernatural event. It's not a uh, something that makes sense to the natural man. God's Spirit has to draw a man for him to understand that he needs God. And that's why we pray for people to be, uh, to be enlightened, that, that they actually need God. Uh, let's see, I'm on the wrong page. I want to get back over here. Uh, I want to read uh, Mark 1, verse uh, 41 through 45 now. And Jesus moved with compassion. Now, sometimes people think that Christ doesn't have compassion. They... They are suffering and they think that Christ doesn't have compassion, but he does. The cross shows us that, that ultimately there's an end to the, the sin curse and the, the problems that are in the world. Christ has paid for sin. He's coming back to take the church back with him. There will ever be with the Lord. And uh, there's an end to it. 
uh, and that he has compassion for us and the cross proves that uh, we'd like for the all the suffering to quit now and people wonder well where is jesus at well he's he's sitting at the right hand of the father making intercession for us and he will come back and put an end to all this suffering um, 41 through 45 and jesus moved with compassion put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him i will be thou clean now the touch of the leper was uh, forbidden but jesus touch didn't make him unclean but it made the leper clean and as soon as he had spoken immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed and he straightway charged him and forthwith sent him away and saith unto him see thou say nothing to any man but go thy way show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing those things which moses commanded for a testimony unto them now you'll find those in, like I say, in Leviticus 13 and 14. But he went out and began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. So this man, he did just the opposite of what Christ did, and it would have been hard to keep quiet, wouldn't it? When Christ touches you, it's hard to be, to be quiet about that. Um he told him to go to the priest. Now, the priest is the one who can declare him clean. That's the job of the priest outlined in Leviticus. And he tells him to go offer, make the offering for thy cleansing. And in, in like I say, in Leviticus 13, 14, you'll see what is outlined for the offering. But Christ sent him to that priest, that religious leader. Uh, <clears throat> And it's going to be a testimony for him. He's going to see that this leper has been cleansed, something that's impossible, um, that man could not do. And they're going to see this, and it's going to prove to that priest that Christ is who he is. And like I say, the priest was the guy assigned by God to diagnose leprosy. So Christ sends him back to the priest to, for the cleansing. And uh, that's interesting, isn't it, that uh, that's how it panned out. Um, I want you to notice here that when the leper came to Christ, he said, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He didn't come to him with a name and claim it attitude. Well, I named this and I claim it, Jesus, and now you got to do it. You know, we don't get to order Christ around. We don't get to order God around like that. Uh, but, you know, when Christ told him not to publish it, Around. I, I don't know, I, a couple of different things, uh, thoughts on that. Maybe it was because, you know, Christ then couldn't enter openly into the city, but was, was out in desert places in verse 45. Or um, Aaron mentioned, you know, it could be like, you know, if we done, if we could do this, we'd be bragging about it. But Christ wasn't bragging about it. I, and you might look at it that way too. That was a point that he brought out this morning. Uh, let's see where we want to go um, in Mark 2 verses 1 through 12 this is a story about the guy it's a popular story and there's a song written about this where they uh, try to you get a guy to Christ and there's but such a crowd around that they take apart some of the roof and let him down through the roof there's four guys do that there's a little song, and I think the name of that song is My Name is Lazarus. Maybe maybe that's the name of it. I, they still play it on the radio, but I, I want to make mention of this. That song isn't, nationally, isn't necessarily scripturally correct. This miracle happened early on in Christ's ministry, and Lazarus' healing was way later on in Christ's ministry. And we know that from Luke chapter 5. This man was let down through the roof and healed by, by Jesus uh, before Matthew was called into the ministry. I mean, you can find that in Luke chapter 5. So um, w when you listen to that song, the, the fourth man, when he gives his testimony, he's Lazarus. And like he's risen, risen from the dead. Lazarus hadn't risen from the dead at this point in Christ's ministry. And uh, I just want to point that out. If you hear that song, then you read chapter Five of Matthew, and you'll find out that the song isn't accurate. Uh, but it, it's a good song; it's a good thought in in, in respect to that. 
that you know if that man was Lazarus, he could give that testimony. But scripturally, that song is not accurate. I I really wouldn't want to buy that song or play that song. But they still play it on the radio, and I'm surprised. Um, look at verses one through twelve out of Matthew or Mark uh, chapter two. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, and so much that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Now he had some good friends here, didn't he? And this guy put some trust in those friends to let him down through that roof. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press. They uncovered the roof where he was, and when he they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Now if we look at Matthew oh, I'm sorry, if you look at Luke uh, five twenty one uh, it tells us also there were Pharisees there too. So it wasn't just the scribes. Uh, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, uh, why doth this man thus see, speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Well, uh, they didn't know it at the time, but Christ was, is God in the flesh. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye things, these things in your hearts? Now, would it be kind of intimidating to be in the company of someone who knows your thoughts, can knows what you're thinking? That would be kind of uh, intimidating, wouldn't it? That's what Jesus done here. Whether it's easy to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. So what what is the reason these men brought this uh, man with the palsy to Christ? Well, obviously to be healed. That's what's on their mind. But Christ didn't do that right off the bat. And I think he did that to so that the, the true lesson, the true need of this man will be brought out. <clears throat> uh <clears throat> They wanted this man to be healed, and naturally this man, I'm certain, wanted to be healed. Uh, <clears throat> I think Christ is wanting to emphasize a, a more important lesson. You know, now some think that when you're, <clears throat> when you're right with God, you just don't have no problems. You know, the roof don't leak, the, you don't have no flat tires, the battery don't go dead, uh, you don't get sick, you know, all's going well for you. And that's what a lot of people think. <clears> or <throat> at least some think. But this man here, when Christ seen his faith, he told him, your sins be forgiven you. But his sins are forgiven. And I know Christ hasn't went to the cross yet, but his sins are forgiven. But is he still sick? He certainly is, isn't he? You know, just because we're sick don't mean we're not saved. Uh, we can be have something wrong with us and still have our sins be forgiven under the blood of Jesus Christ. This man was still a sick man, but Christ had forgiven his sins. <clears throat> and some blame sickness on uh, <clears throat> sin. And that's just not always the case. Now, I'm not saying that God hasn't used sickness to, just like the, the king in the Old Testament there, Uzziah. Um, 
he was struck with leprosy because of sin in his life. He tried to offer, you know, he went in to offer incense and, and did that when they, you know, they tried to stop him. But he did it anyway and was struck with leprosy. Uh, <clears throat> Miriam, when they challenged Moses, uh, was struck with leprosy. But she, you know, she was healed. But here's an example of why sickness isn't always because of sin. Now, ultimately, we're sick. Sickness entered into the world because of the curse that's on, you know, it's, it's because of Adam and Eve and what they, their fall in the garden. The curse was placed on man, but all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know that. It's not just, we can't just point the finger at all of them and say that we're innocent because we're not either. But here's a good example of why sickness doesn't always mean that someone's out of the will of God. <clears throat> In chapter 9 of St. John, it says, And Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Uh, this man's sickness wasn't because of sin of him or his parents the disciples actually thought that that was the cause and people still today they think well, if you get sick you know it's because you've done something bad wrong that's not necessarily the case it was that the works of god should be made manifest in him uh, if god decides to strike me with something and I get sick, but God's glorified through it. That, that's up to God to do that. That's his business. Uh, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Uh, whether I live or whether I die, I'm, I'm the Lord's. Uh, let's see. Get my page turned here. Now Christ is going to show them a, a bigger lesson. I think because of him uh, holding back healing the man. He didn't heal the man first. And he asked the question to get them thinking. You know, well, which is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or take up thy bed and walk? Well, if uh, I thought of this little illustration here, just let's say... Um, there's someone who can't walk and they, they're in a little motorized wheelchair and, um, and those things are great for people who need them and you know, we, we hope we don't need one but if, if we do, well, we're glad that that stuff's available. But say they run over my foot and uh, then they apologize. I say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm there. You know, my foot's are hurting. They say, oh, I'm sorry. And I tell them, I say, well, that's all right. I'll forgive you. Well, do you really know that I forgive them or not? Is there any tangible evidence that I really in my heart forgive them or am I just mad uh, and just afraid to say something? Uh, do I Have I really forgiven them? Is there evidence of that? Can you see that somehow that I have actually forgiven them? Well, you don't. When Christ said, Thy sins be forgiven thee, they're accusing him of blasphemy. They're saying only God can do that. Well, he actually is God in the flesh, so I said, but there's no tangible evidence that his sins are actually forgiven. Christ saying, well, which is easier to say? Uh, that, where there's no real evidence, or take up thy bed and walk. Now, if, if I tell that guy that, you know, in the illustration, that hasn't happened to me. But if I tell the guy, that, say, a guy runs over my foot with that little, little wheelchair and he can't walk. And I say, well, I'll tell you, I'll forgive you. And on top of that. Uh, I'm going to heal you. You get up out of that chair and walk. Now that guy is, if I've really got that power of healing, he's going to have to get up and walk to show it. And so that's a much harder s statement to say. So, uh, in, so that he could be a witness, the, the healing here became a witness to who Christ really is. Um, so that he could show that he could actually forgive sins also. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. 
He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thy house. And that's exactly what he did. So Jesus uh, proved, again, by his miracle, who he really is, that he is the Son of God. Uh, you know, and God was glorified by this in verse 12. And immediately he arose and took up his bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We've never seen it on this fashion. And you know, for us to be a witness, we have to glorify God in what we do. It's not a, Hey, look at me, what I can do. It's uh, how do we bring glory to God? Uh, now, a question I asked the church today was, uh, Is it okay to be angry? And the answer is yes, if you're angry at the right thing. You know, we may be angry at some injustices, things have been done wrong to people. Um, sin, uh, the way that people treat God, um, those kind of things can very well make us angry, and uh, we will be, excuse me, I'm going to drop something, drop my marker. Um, being angry for the right reason is one thing, but uh, there's an anger that we shouldn't have, too. We won't be angry because someone got the last donut out of the box. <laughs> uh, that might be the, that would be the wrong kind of anger. But uh, let's see what do we want to read. I want to read Mark uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And he entered again into the synagogue. And there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. Now notice, they're not watching to see if he can, they're watching to see if he will. They, they know that he can. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. Now Christ is not hiding this, he's not getting him over to the side where no one will notice. He's right out, stand forth. You know, in other words, he's, he's getting him out in the open where they, they will see what's going to happen. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. They wouldn't answer the question. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, they had no compassion. You know, and we'd read earlier that Christ had compassion for sick. They didn't have the compassion. They didn't care about this guy. Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth, and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Now, it's uh, interesting that uh, the uh, Herodians and the Pharisees teamed up. The Herodians were people who sided with the Herod family, which got their power from Rome. And of course, the uh, Jews are under Roman rule, so they didn't like that. But uh, the Herodians you know, got their power from Rome. You know, the, uh, the Herod family got their power from Rome, and these people sided with the, the Herod family. Well, the Pharisees naturally didn't like that. But it's interesting that these two people, these two groups of people, consider Christ their common enemy. And you know, in today's society, Christ is more and more considered the enemy and not the fix. You know, when I was a young fellow, a lot of people considered Christ the fix. They considered, the, they recognized the fact that they needed to go to church. They may not go to church. They may not. Uh, listen to preaching and they may not have turned their heart over to God but at that time but they realized that they would admit that that was the answer to their problem in their life they, they would admit that they, they needed to do those things nowadays you're getting people who just they totally reject Christ they look at the Christian as the enemy uh, I have a little illustration of that but I, I can't remember the, the, the facts but uh I remember something bad happened, um, and uh, 
people uh, blame the Christians for. They said, well, they, they probably bullied this person. That's why they did that terrible thing. And I, I can't remember the details of it, but I'll have to look it up and find out. But my point is the Christians were blamed. They, they were accused of bullying this person, and this person did this thing because they were bullied. Um, is what the, this person said. That was their explanation. Vilified the Christian instead of the criminal. <laughs> so, but you can expect that. I mean, they didn't like Christ, and, and we can just expect that. That's what we're gonna. That's what's going to happen. Um, I think this story here this shows that uh, neither religion nor politics is the solution. Uh, the solution is Jesus Christ. This man's problem was cured and Christ did no wrong in, in healing him on the Sabbath. Uh, <clears throat> in chapter 7, I'm not going to uh, deal with that very much. I don't want to make this too long. and uh, they, they kind of cram a little too much into this. But in chapter 7, Jesus heals a man who has uh, who can't hear and he has an impediment of speech. But he had some people who cared enough for him to bring him to Christ, and Christ healed the man. Uh, and I thought that was a great thing, that, that he had people that, that cared about him and would bring him to Christ to be healed. And uh, no doubt there could have been someone else, uh, maybe themselves, that need healing also. Uh, but they thought enough of this guy to, to get him to Christ. You know, do we think enough of people to get them to Christ? That's that's one of the things. We need to care about people enough to get them to Christ, to get that message to them. We're going to look at, um, in Matthew chapter 10, verses uh, 46 through 52, um, <clears throat> this story of blind Bartimaeus, we have his name right here. Now, there's some other accounts that are similar to this and I don't know if it's the same account or not but they are similar there are some differences um, so I'm just going to look at this as this is blind Bartimaeus' account and I'm not sure about the other ones if they they're the same uh, story or not I've wondered about that through the years but I can't really determine right now so I'll just leave it at that this is blind Bartimaeus anyway uh, verses uh, 46 through 52. And he came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, Timaeus uh, sat by the wayside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now, he somehow knew about Jesus. He had some had information about Christ some way, somehow in his life. And when he heard that Christ was, was there, he cried out to him. Now, sometimes people, they may have heard about Jesus. They may know they need Jesus, but... They they get the idea that, hey, you know, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it right now. Uh, there might be something I don't want to give up to follow Jesus. And when I want to, I'll follow Jesus. But this man right here, he couldn't see. And he heard that Christ was coming by. So he calls out to him. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more, a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now this man is taking advantage of the time that he has to, to get to Christ. He probably thinks, hey, this opportunity may never come again in my life. You know, the Holy Spirit, someone can't come to God on their terms when they want to. The Holy Spirit has to draw them. And when that time, when you feel that tugging of the Holy Spirit on your heart, and you know that the Holy Spirit is drawing you to Christ, that's the time to react. This man right here knew that this is his moment in time to get to Christ. He probably thought, hey, you know, this time may not never come again for me. And so he takes advantage of it. And look what he does. And Jesus stood still 
and commanded him to be called. You know, if we draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to God to us. If we want Christ, we can have Christ. But when that spirit is drawing you, that's the time to answer. And they called unto the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort. Rise, he calleth thee. Now look what he does here. And he, and he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. He wanted to get to Christ fast. And he probably thought, well, this garment's going to hold me back. Uh, that's the way I see this. And uh, he's cast it aside. You know, I'm not, I don't want nothing to hold me back. You know, and we think, is there something that, that I don't want to let go of that keeps me from serving God like I should? Keeps me from being a witness for Jesus Christ than I should. Is there something that I don't want to cast away? I mean, it may not be something sinful or bad within itself, but it may be something I need to put away out of my life and get my priorities straight. Due to the person that's unsaved, is there something that they want to hold on to that they realize coming to Christ that the Holy Spirit's going to deal with their life? And, uh, you know, Paul wrote to the Romans, should we continue sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Is there some pleasure or sin that they want to hold on to that they know that they come to Christ, they're going to be convicted of that, and they will need to, to lay that aside. But this man cast away his garment, and uh, we don't know if he had, I wonder about, you know, he's begging, so did he have his money in a pouch on his side or something he's put it in, or was it in a container there, and he just left it? Well, those are details we just don't know. But anyway, he got, got rid of that garment and threw it away. But what if he hadn't been healed. He has confidence that Christ is going to heal him, but let's say he don't. You know, not all of us are healed in our life. Uh, we don't necessarily always get healing. See Larry uh, Webb there watching. I don't know who else is. I just got Larry Webb showed up there. Thank you, Larry. Good, good to hear from you. Um, this man, uh, let's say does he really know that he's going to be healed? Does he know that Christ is going to do for him what he's going to ask? Uh, maybe he doesn't know that for certain. Maybe he's got faith that he, he feels like Christ is going to. Maybe he's heard enough about Christ that he thinks, oh, I, for sure he's going to heal me. But at any rate, this gar garment become of less value. Now, if Christ hadn't healed him, he would have to go back and find that garment, wouldn't he? Blind. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Uh, a blind man uh, asking, the, he asking a blind man this. Now it's pretty um, pretty obvious that he's going to, to say he wants to receive his sight. And that's exactly what he says and what I would say. And it's interesting here. There's, I, I haven't dwelled a whole lot on this, but there's probably a, a deep, meaning in what the question that Christ asked. Um, you wouldn't think Christ would ask him that. You'd think, he said, hey, I'll, I'll heal you. But uh, he asked Bartimaeus, what would you have me to do for you? What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus says unto him, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight. And now he's got his sight. He followed Jesus. He's got his sight spiritually. And he's got his sight physically. He's put his trust in Jesus. And he's following Jesus. He was healed two ways. Spiritually and physically. Just like the, the man with the paralysis. Uh, the palsy. Uh, he, he needed spiritual. Spiritual healing and physical healing. Uh, some thoughts I'd, I'd like to, uh, to leave to leave with you with before I <clears throat> finish up here. You know, there are people dealing with all kinds of problems, all kinds of sickness. And obviously not everyone is healed. Um, <clears throat> some are and some aren't. And, you know, even Paul, in, if you read uh, the writings of Paul and, and uh, you, you find that he he had healed some people, but not everyone that he knew that was sick 
did he heal? So not everyone receives healing. And some people go through a long time of suffering in their life. And, and you see that. And uh, David wrote some things about that. And that may be where you're at in your life. You may be wondering, you know, how long am I going to go through this? You know, why isn't God healing me? Why am I going through this suffering? And, you know, those are questions that people wonder about when they, you know, and there's been uh, preachers who have died of cancer. Uh, Adrian Rogers uh, died of cancer, and uh, I remember J. Vernon McGee had cancer. I don't know just what he died of, but David Jeremiah has went through cancer and went through some other illnesses, and, uh, you know, people who are dedicated to, to Christ, to the preaching of the gospel, and but yet they got sick. And uh, there's other people that you, you, you probably know of that have been sick maybe for years and, and suffering. You know, uh, I can tell you, uh, well, I ask the question, have you ever been so sick that you, if you, you thought, well, if I can't get better, I just don't care if I go ahead and die. I can remember having the flu uh, and thinking that, just, you know, uh, if the best I can remember is the flu. But anyway, I was so sick, I I thought, man, you know, if I can't get any better, I'd just as soon go ahead, go home and be with the Lord. And if it can't be any better than this, you know, just so sick and finally got better. I can remember a lady at church uh, years ago, she, she had the flu, and she said uh, she was so sick at that time, she wouldn't have cared if she went ahead and died. She said, I'm kind of glad I didn't after, <laughs> after I got better. But um, People go through these things, and they, they wonder, how long am I going to endure this? And David wrote about this. Now, this is a man after God's own heart. In First Samuel 13, um, verse 14, you find he was the man... That God chose after his own heart. Um, and I want to read in Psalm 6, and I'm going to read that psalm in Psalm 13, and then I'll finish up here. David wondered about this. So people do wonder that, you know, and I don't have the answer to why God doesn't heal everyone and why, you know, I know why they're sick. It's, it's sin, and it's, I'm not saying that you're sick because you're sin. Sometimes that is a case, but. I'm not saying that people that are sick are going through that because of sin. Uh, that's not always the case. But here's what David wrote. O Lord, o Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul also my soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O oh Lord, how long? He asked that question. How long am I going through this? How long am I going to have to endure this? Return, O oh Lord, deliver my soul, O oh, save me from thy, for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All the night I make my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old, waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. For the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be shamed, ashamed suddenly. Uh, a little verse here, I, I give you something, might give you a little laugh. Sometimes I aggravate my wife. Uh, <laughs> you might not think I'm aggravating, but uh, sometimes I, I get her a little aggravated because you know, I'm a little sloppy at times and things. And, and when I get her real aggravated about stuff I've done, she she quotes this verse to me. I'm weary with my groaning. All the night I make my bed to swim. 
I water my calves with my tears. <laughs> She'll quote that verse to me when I, I get her kind of aggravated. And I do occasionally. Not um, intensely, but it happens. Um, I'm chapter 13 of Psalms. I heard a preacher preaching about this, and I looked it up. I'm pretty sure this is the chapter he was in. And he was talking about this topic, you know, people that go through things in life, and they wonder, you know, how long, or, you know, um, where are you at in my life? And uh, David wondered this too. So we go through things in life that are tough. And uh, sometimes people wonder, you know, how long is it going to last? So David writes in the 13th Psalm, that other Psalm was the 6th Psalm. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep in the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved, but I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. He ends up on a good note, but David, you can tell here that he's troubled in this psalm. And people go through trouble, trouble times in their life, but I can't say why people go through these things. Uh, I know ultimately sin from the, the garden on ahead up is, is part of, I mean, it's, it's why we have sickness and death. We know that. But the good thing, Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection, his shed blood on the cross, there is an end to it. We have to realize that there is an end to uh, the suffering in this world and it's not going to go on forever. David says, you know, how long is this going to last? Well, I don't know, but when Christ comes back, we know that there is an end to it. But the thing of it is, you have to be ready for him. When he comes back, you have to have already put your faith and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection, be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and suffering will be ended one day. You know, I am uh, look myself on this thing, I say different times, you know, I, I'm not the fellow I was when I was 16. I'm all wrinkled up now and gray-haired. And uh, I know, uh, you know, I'm inching closer to the, to the, I'm in the checkout line, as <laughs> one preacher said. I, I realize that. I got less years ahead of me than there are behind me. But I know that uh, there's a time when we step into eternity and Jesus Christ has purchased our salvation for us and put your faith and trust in him. If you do, uh, let us know at the church. Thank you, Larry, for watching and whoever else is there. I don't know uh, who who else is uh, watching, but I sure appreciate everyone that does and I hope you all have a, a good week.